Hello everyone, my name is Clentus and welcome to the Iron Bars, my true crime YouTube channel. Well today guys, I want to address three things before I go any further. The first one I want to say thank you to each and every one of you who is subscribing to my YouTube channel and everybody that is watching my videos. The only thing guys which leads me to number two that you are not quite doing is liking my videos. Guys, when you like a video, you are actually helping the YouTuber for the algorithm to promote the videos to more people. So if you're just going to watch, which is highly appreciated, you still have to engage the video with a like and also leave a comment down below. It does help the channel to grow faster. And the third thing that I want to address in this video today, please, if you are going to get triggered because there are very graphic words that I'm going to be using, such as rape, such as murder, such as abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, and that sort of stuff. If you think this is something that is going to trigger you in any way, please click off this video and go watch something else. Maybe next time you can watch another video from me where I don't have to necessarily mention words such as the ones that I just said in this video. So consider this as a disclaimer. So without further ado, let's get into today's case. And it is the case of South Africa's worst serial killer, also known as the ABC killer, Moses Sitole. Something definitely is in the water in Pretoria. Guys, what's happening? So Moses Sitole was born on the 17th of November, 1964, making him a Scorpio. Simon Sitole was one of five children born to Simon and Sophie Sitole. He was born in the East Rand, a township called Fosloras near Boxburg, South Africa. So when Moses Sitole was five years old, his father unfortunately passed on. His father was the sole breadwinner of the family and he took care of a really large family, including his own extended family. Unfortunately, again, after his father's death, his mother, Sophie, who became a drunkard and abandoned all of her children who ended up in orphanage homes. Where Simon Sitole says he experienced the most unbelievable mistreatment, which included physical abuse as well as mental abuse. It is said that Moses Sitole was a very intelligent child. He seemed to have a very bright future ahead of him, despite growing up under apartheid South Africa. Moses Sitole always hated to see his mother drunk, but he loved his mother. But for some reason, his mother did not want him or either of his siblings, and he never understood why this woman hated him. Moses Sitole does say that when he was a little boy, he unfortunately was raped by somebody he knew, and that changed his life. He knew that whatever this person was doing to him, was wrong but he had no power he had no control on how he was going to turn around and punish this individual and it so happened to be a woman he does say that when his father died everything turned for the worse it seemed like the world had just abandoned them it turned its back on them because at one point after his father's death they were evicted from the 10 room house they lived in in Fosloras. so they found themselves on the street with a mother who didn't care, all she cared about was a bottle of alcohol. She was found in every tavern around Fosloras and she would not even care that she had children. People would say to her, hey woman, you have children, go take care of them. And she would say they would take care of themselves. Mind you, Moses Itole is still practically a toddler. Life would not get better for Moses Itole because he would be bounced from one orphanage to the next and all the orphanages that he would land in, he would experience extreme amounts of abuse. He later said he was treated bad, real bad, he would tell everybody, that he hated the way he was brought up. He further said that he learned to survive at a very young age. He knew how to evade trouble. He knew how to evade abuse. He knew how to evade anything that was going to cause him pain. But the pain of being abandoned by his mother was the worst kind of pain. He considered it as a betrayal. So when Moses Sitole turned eight, he ran away from an orphanage that he was at. He went in search of his mother. When he finally found his mother, she was drunk and she was not thrilled 
to see him. But instead of embracing her son, she grabbed him by the hand and dragged him back to the orphanage and told him, never come back to me again. Moses Etole said he looked at his mother with disbelief. He just could not understand why his mother was doing this to him. Despite telling her that I'm being abused, the mother looked at him and said, I'm still going to beat you if you stay with me. Mosi Tola said, I would rather get abused by you than a stranger. Mosi Tola described his life as hurt personified. He said it was hurt every minute of every hour, every day, every week, every month, and every year. He experienced nothing but pain and suffering. Hurt. When Moses Itola was 11 years old, he was moved to another province of South Africa called KwaZulu Natal or KZN as we call it here in South Africa. Now KwaZulu Natal or KZN is also known as the Kingdom of the Zulus. That is where I'm from. Yes, I am Zulu myself. KZN, it is indeed our kingdom. But specifically, I come from a city called Durban, which is also known as South Africa's playground. So Moses Sitola, when he arrived in KZN, he did not like it at all. He is in a strange place, which is six hours away from his home, and he did not know anybody. Yes, he spoke Isi Zulu, but he did not understand the type of Zulu that was spoken in KZN. So he just wanted to leave. When Moses Sitola was 13 or about 14 years old, he ran away from the orphanage in KZN. He went to the N3 and where he hitchhiked, all the way back to Johannesburg. Now, like I said, Durban and Johannesburg are about six and a half hours apart when you are driving by car. But if you are going to be going by a bus, it will take you about eight hours. If you take a flight, it's about 45 minutes flight. So when he ran away from KZN to Johannesburg, he went back straight to Fosloras, but not to his mother, but this time to his older brother who already had his own house. When he got there, he just begged his brother, please do not let me go back to that place. All these people do to me is abuse me and abuse me and I cannot take it anymore. The brother said to him, well, if you are going to stay with me, then you will have to go and find a job so you can contribute to the household. Mosi Tola had no issue with that. Indeed, he went out and found himself a job. He would find himself peace jobs whether it's cleaning gardens or making gardens or he would basically wash other people's cars or whatever it is that was going to keep him under his brother's roof. He made sure that he got the money for it and indeed he was contributing for food as well as rent and other things that were needed in the house. So his brother said nothing. All he did was just keep quiet while Moses Sitola grew up under his roof. While Moses Sitola was living under his brother's roof, he also took an interest in boxing. Boxing felt to him like a way of developing his strength and power. He felt powerful as a boxer. He felt like he was invincible and he loved it. He was so dedicated to boxing that everybody knew Moses Sitola as a good boxer. And as he was growing a little bit older, he was also developing into a handsome young man and women were literally falling on his feet wanting to be his girlfriend. Women described him as intelligent, handsome, and very charming. And indeed, everybody does say that, including the police and wardens and everybody that came across Moses Sitole all said the same thing about him. Well-spoken, intelligent, and very charming. Even his own defense attorney once said, Moses Sitole was very charming. He was intelligent and well-spoken. He could not understand how he was so well-spoken considering the fact that it was still the apartheid days and many black people at the time were not speaking English. But Moses Sitole was fluent in English at the time. Apparently when Moses Sitole got to Fosslora and when he started to be independent, he decided to move to Pretoria, Atrichville to be precise, and when he got to Pretoria, he enrolled himself in a Pretoria library club where he would go there almost every day and read some books so that he can improve his English vocabulary. So that is why Moses Sitole seemed intelligent as well as well spoken in English. Moses Sitole knew that women loved him, but he had no respect for them whatsoever. 
however the irony of it all he always wanted women around him he wanted the touch of a woman he wanted women to be all around him at all times he would be with a girlfriend why having a girlfriend he would get another girlfriend why having that girlfriend he would have another one and then another one and another one he had girlfriends absolutely everywhere he went whether it was on the train or in the taxi or whether he was going to another township he would have a girlfriend and women like i said they would just accept his approach and they would become his girlfriends However, Mosi Tolle had little patience for women. He had no tolerance whatsoever for women. He would get angry, and when he gets angry at a woman, he would beat her up. The one thing that Mosi Tolle hated that came from a woman was rejection. If a woman that he liked, he approached her and she rejected him, he would not take a no for an answer. He would beat her up until she says, yes, I will be your girlfriend. In 1987, Moses Tolle saw a beautiful girl and he said, this one is definitely going to be mine. Unfortunately for him, that girl already had a boyfriend. And when she told him that I already have a boyfriend, Moses Tolle took that as a rejection and he beat her up so badly that she ended up agreeing to be his girlfriend. In the same year, a 38-year-old Patricia Kumalo found herself getting beaten, raped, as well as beating some more. And this woman who was the auntie of a girl that he wanted had said to Moses Tolle, you are going to leave my niece alone. But Moses Tolle was like, there is no way I'm going to be told by you what to do. And that is when he beat her up. After beating her up, he raped her. This was Moses Tolle's first rape at the age of 22. I know what you're thinking because I'm thinking it too. So did she go to the police and report the rape as well as the assault? No, she didn't. She was terrified of Moses Sitole. Moses Sitole, when he became a boxer, he gained himself a reputation around townships in Pretoria as well as in Johannesburg. Moses Sitole attacks yet another woman by the name of Lindy Wengosi. Lindy Wengosi was Moses' girlfriend's sister. So it's clear that he had no boundaries whatsoever. If you were a woman, he didn't care whether you were the sister of his girlfriend or the friend of his sister's girlfriend or whatever the case was as long as you were a woman and he landed his eyes on you you would be his whether you like it or not so Lindy Wengosi was minding her own business when Moses Sitole approached her and said listen I want you to accompany me somewhere and it is somewhere that is a little bit far and I need somebody to talk to along the way so to reach the area where they were going to Moses Sitole told Lindy where that you know what we're going to have to take a shortcut through this desolate field and then with Lindy well, of course she had no problem I mean uh, Moses Sitole is a boxer what could happen in his hand he seemed to be carrying a two liter bottle of something he turned around and looked at Lindy and said listen take off your clothes if you are not going to take off your clothes I'm going to pour this petrol or gasoline all over you and I will set you on fire alive Lindy Wengosi did not believe what she was hearing, but she could see right through him that he was serious. So because she did not want to be burnt alive, she began to take off her clothes, including her underwear. That is when Moses Itole took her underwear and gagged her with it while he was raping her. So when he was done raping Lindy Wengosi, he began to choke her. He choked her to a point where she passed out. When Lindy Wengosi came to, Moses was still standing over her. He grabbed her by the neck one more time and he threatened her that if you told anybody about what just happened, I will kill you. Terrified and survived a terrible ordeal, Lindy Wood decided to comply and not go to the authorities and report Moses Sitole for having attacked her and raped her and almost killing her. Feeling invincible and powerful, Moses Sitole felt he was not going to get caught and that is when he went and attacked more women. He raped them, he would attack them, and then rape them. In February of 1989, Moses Sitole was working for a supermarket as a stock taker. That is when he met a woman by the name of Doris. He stopped working immediately and pretended like he was a businessman of some sort because Moses Sitole was always smartly dressed. And number two, he's charming, intelligent, and well-spoken. So he went and told Doris that he was a successful businessman that lived in another area. 
At the time, Doris was looking for a job, and that is when Moses Itwale said, as I've mentioned, I'm a successful businessman, and I am looking for a worker, and I think you are just the perfect person that I want to work for me. Of course, Doris was excited at her luck that she just found a job just like that. In her mind, she was like, there is no way I'm going to pass up this opportunity. So instead of making an appointment with Doris to come to his business, facility instead he told doris hey listen let's go to the train station and go to my business facility where you are going to start your job immediately but as they were going to the train station most of was like uh -uh. instead of taking the train at the jimmy Stint train station let's rather walk to my business because it's just on the other side of town so we are going to go through this desolate area as our shortcut to my business Doris, of course, she had no issue with that. She was fine and she felt that she was also safe because the man looked trustworthy. He was well-spoken, intelligent, and business-looking. So she had no worries, no concern. She just went along with this man. So as Moses and Doris were walking through this desolate field, that is when he turned around and took out a knife and pointed at Doris and said, take out your underwear. Doris was confused and terrified at the same time and that is when Moses came even closer to her and said if you are not going to take away your underwear I'm going to cut you into pieces. Of course Doris realized that this man is crazy and serious she took off her underwear. After Doris had handed her underwear to Moses that is when Moses used her underwear to tie her hands with her own underwear. When Moses was done tying Doris both her hand and feet with her own clothes that is when moses began to beat up doris he beat her so badly he ended up raping her when he was done raping her he looked at her and said if you are going to take this to the authorities or tell anybody i'm going to find you and i'm going to kill you and i'm going to kill you forever so after threatening doris moses Itole left doris tied up in the felt and he went back to work at the supermarket that he was working at. About three months after her ordeal with Moses Sitole, she was walking down the city streets of Johannesburg CBD. That is when Doris saw a man that looked exactly like Moses Sitole. She looked twice and indeed it was Moses Sitole. She immediately went to the payphone and called the police. And then she pointed at Moses Sitole. And that is when Moses Sitole was arrested by the police. I keep saying Moses a lot, hey? Let me just say Moses from this point. So Moses was arrested by the police, but he was extradited to Jamestown, Cleveland to be precise, where he had beaten and raped Doris. However, while they were driving to Jamestown, the police did something quite strange. They threw Moses at the back of the police van together with Doris. That is when Moses looked at Doris and said, what did I tell you? Didn't I say, if you tell anybody, I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you. And when I kill you, I'm going to kill you forever. And his last words to Doris was, bitch, I should have killed you when I had the chance. So when Moses Toller was taken to court, he told the judge that Doris must have confused him with another man because he does not know this woman. And definitely he is no rapist. Unfortunately for Moses Toller, the judge did not believe him. But instead, the judge found him guilty and sentenced him to seven years in prison. The sentence angered Moses. He was so angry that he promised himself that he will find Doris and he will kill her as many times as he can. He said that he felt betrayed by Doris. Um, so you beat her. So basically you lie to somebody, you beat them up, you rape them, and then when they call the police on you, you say they betrayed you? What kind of sickness is this, people? So Moses started his sentence and in prison, he was telling everybody and anybody willing to listen to him that he was an innocent man. Now, in the prison that he was in, rapists were not wanted. In fact, the inmates there hated a rapist, and as a result, they wanted to teach Moses a lesson. He got raped in prison multiple times, and he was also rejected by other inmates 
because they do not hang out with rapists. One of the prisoners said to him, we want to teach you a lesson and also make you taste your own medicine. And that aggravated Moses even more. He hated Doris. He hated Doris so much that she had put him through this hell that he was experiencing in prison. But on the other hand, Moses seemed to be a very well-behaved prisoner. Warden saw him as a model prisoner. And we all know what happens when you are a model prisoner. Early release. So while Moses was still in prison, he met a woman by the name of Martha Ndlovu. Now Martha Ndlovu had a brother in the same prison as Moses. Now they somehow formed a relationship that in 1993 when Moses Sitole was released, he went straight to Martha's house and they lived together as husband and wife, despite never getting married. The people in the township knew them as husband and wife. How? They didn't care. All they knew was that they were husband and wife. However, Martha's family was not having it because they did not trust Moses Sitole. They knew that he was a ex-con and he went to prison for rape and assault of women. And there is no way they were going to allow her to be in a relationship with that kind of a person. And Martha's brother himself, who was in prison, did not like it at all that Moses was involved with his sister Martha. However, one of Martha's brothers did not have a problem with this relationship. As a matter of fact, he offered Moses a job as a mechanic because he was a mechanic in his father's backyard. So he said, listen, because you're coming from prison and you don't have a job and it's highly unlikely that you are going to get employed with your criminal record, why don't you work for me as a mechanic? and I will pay you at the end of the month so you are able to take care of my sister. Moses had no problem. He accepted the job and then he started working with Maxwell, which is Martha's brother. Moses considered Maxwell as his brother-in-law. Moses saw this job as a new beginning, a fresh start, and he, could not, and he couldn't be happier. I mean, he was in love with Martha. He seemed to love Martha and he seemed to respect Martha. I'm not sure, maybe because he was respecting Martha's brother. As a result, he was not causing the pain that he was causing other women on Martha. I tried to find out what was so different about Martha versus all the other women that he had disrespected, so much so that he beat and raped them. Unfortunately, I could not find anything. So let's move to 1994. So in 1994, South Africa moved from apartheid into democracy. Nelson Mandela was elected as the first democratic president of the Republic of South Africa in that year. The world was in awe and South Africa was to become the pedestal for humanity in the world. I remember 1994, however, I did not quite understand what was going on, but I knew of apartheid However, I did not experience it, even though I was growing up in the last legs of apartheid. And the only thing that I knew was the stories that were told to me by my parents and my grandparents about apartheid. So I did not necessarily have any sort of experience. Maybe the only experience I may have had was the fact that I grew up in a township which was designated by the apartheid government for black people and white people lived in suburbs, black people lived in townships. It would be like in America, the black people live in the projects and the white people lived in suburbs or whatever the case is. So that is maybe the only experience I may have had with apartheid, but where I was called the K word or treated differently by a white person, no, I did not experience that at all. However, I knew of apartheid, like I said, so in 1994, I remember everybody was just celebrating black, white, everybody. And for the first time in 1994, South Africans, especially black South Africans, could move about South Africa anywhere and everywhere they wanted. And they could stay anywhere they wanted. If they want to live in the suburbs, if they got the money for it, they would buy houses in suburbs or cities or whatever the case might be. Even my own family moved away from the township into the city. And it was back in the apartheid days that that could not have happened. So that's what was happening in 1994 going forward to date. 
So now that black people were allowed to move from one province to the next or to, a, to the township, to suburbs and things of that nature, many young women came from other provinces into Johannesburg or Gauteng province for that matter, which is the economic hub of South Africa and Africa for that matter. And there were lots of job opportunities that were in Johannesburg as well as Pretoria. So many black young women left their homesteads and went to Johannesburg or Pretoria to find jobs. And that was a treasure trove for Moses Sitole because he knew that these women that were coming from rural areas and other places in South Africa were quite naive and they were desperate for a job. And that was going to satisfy his sexual predation. So six months after starting his job with Maxwell, he quit the job and he decided that he was going to go out and go and find a job in Johannesburg or in the city of Pretoria. He will fold a newspaper and put it under his arm and leave the house early hours of the morning. Martha knew that her husband was waking up every morning to go find a job. In fact, Moses Sitole was planning for his first murder. Like the coward that he is, he targeted his society's most vulnerable, unemployed young black women. So about the 5th or the 10th of July 1994, Moses Sitole meets a 19-year-old Maria Manama in Pretoria who was looking for a job. Moses introduced himself as Sylvester to Maria. Moses was looking smart, he was professional looking, he spoke very well, and Maria believed every single word that he told her. You and I already know his MO or modus operandi, that he is going to charm the pants of the woman as well as show himself that he knows things as a professional and that also he's a successful businessman. So immediately he has introduced himself and basically presented himself as a successful businessman. His other MO, he will tell the woman, listen, then follow me to my business facility where you are going to start immediately working for me. And of course, he took Maria through this desolate area in Pretoria. And that is where he turned around, attacked her and he strangled her. That was Moses Sitole's first murder. Maria's body was found but on her leg there was a cryptic note that read i am not fighting with you we will stay here until you understand okay what does that even mean moses went back to martha and he began to plan his second murder in five months moses sitole had murdered five women so at this point, Moses Sitole had graduated from just raping to murder. So he would rape and then murder his victims. And at this point, the police were baffled. They were finding bodies here, a body here, and a body there. While they were busy gathering information about a current body on the slab, they would get a call to tell them another body has been found of a young black woman. For some reason, Moses knew how to evade the police. He was always a few steps ahead of the police, which made their jobs extremely difficult to put together a profile of the person that is doing this to women. And the bravado of Moses, every time he murdered a woman, he would take her body to the exact spot where the police found the previous body. The audacity of him all. And at this point, the newspapers were on a frenzy. They just wanted to find as much information as possible about the murderer. They wanted to know how far the police were in finding out who this person that is killing black young women that are seeking for work. So the police had put up a possible scenario. They said that this man will lure women and lie to them that he is successful or he's a businessman or he is a manager of a big company and they are hiring and then he would tell these women that he has a job for them and then he would take them to the field where he murders them and later their bodies would be found by someone or the police. The reason why Moses Sitole was using this plan was because it worked on his first victim, which was Doris. So when Moses Sitole saw the news that his bodies were being discovered and were covered by the news, 
he was thrilled he got even thirstier to murder more women so he saw his plan as working perfectly luring women who are seeking for a job he will tell them accompany me to my company where i'm going where you are going to start immediately where he will turn around attack them rape them and then strangle them if you think about strangulation it is the most painful way to die because the person that is strangling you has the power to let go while he is strangling you and then you of course will pass out and then he can always resume strangling you basically he can prolong your death as long as he wants to so i feel that moses sitole was very very cruel towards women especially when he was killing them by strangulation he made sure that they died a slow and painful death and we will find out why he was doing that continue watching and then the most sadistic thing that moses sitole enjoyed was women who carried purses with straps on when he lured them into these isolated fields he would use the strap of the purse and and basically create a noose and he would hang them from the tree and he would watch them while while kicking for their lives until they go limp at some point moses sitole felt that it was boring just killing these women he will go into their purses and when he finds a phone number he will dial the number usually some women would have phone numbers of their moms or their dads or their grandparents or somebody that is back home and moses would take that number and call these families and taunt them he called a grandmother of one girl and this is what he said to her it serves you well you are now walking over the grave of your granddaughter that's what moses did he called a grandparent of a woman he just murdered and told her those words just when you think moses's craziness couldn't be crazier he calls the police station anonymously and gives them the name of his brother-in-law maxwell and say he is the murderer the police of course went and followed up they went and arrested maxwell and took him to the police station and then they interrogated him when they realized that no he is the wrong guy he was set free so when he was set free moses was already waiting at his brother-in-law's house when the brother-in-law arrived and when he arrived he started telling them of the strangest thing that happened to him that he got arrested for the murders of the women that they've been watching on the news and then moses was like so what did the police say what did they find out what moses was doing was cleverly finding out from his brother-in-law's interrogation how far and what the police how far the police were in the investigations and what do they know and unfortunately maxwell was not given that type of information by the police so that frustrated him but at least he knew that the police were looking for somebody that was murdering these women of course the police will be looking i mean you're murdering people so on the 5th of december 1994 martha gives birth to a baby girl moses sitole has just become a father of a baby girl unfortunately martha had no idea that her husband is a murderer basically a serial killer about july of 1995 moses sitole had strangled and killed 18 women and discarded their bodies in desolate areas in johannesburg as well as pretoria the police once again did all that they could to find this man but to no avail some police even felt guilty every time they went to pick up another body they felt responsible because they could not catch the man that was killing these women some police were feeling demoralized they felt that they were not doing good enough of a job and yet moses sitole seemed to be invincible so it was not just the police that were concerned the news that was going out to communities around pretoria and johannesburg concerned a lot of women and their daughters they were all talking amongst each other how they need to protect themselves they started talking about they need to avoid walking alone at night avoid a man that comes to you and offer you a job 
do not respond to such job offers don't go with a man that says follow me i will take you to my business where you will start immediately so women were basically being empowered with information from the police about the about the modus operandi of this killer and moses sitole did not like that at all so he had to go back to the drawing board and come up with a different strategy on how he was going to lure women to their death he read the newspaper and watched the news on the telly every single day to keep himself informed so while he was sitting at Martha's house he came up with a brilliant idea he was like oh now that i cannot pretend to be a businessman then let me create an organization an organization that is going to deal with social ills in the society remember when he was a child he used to be bound from one orphanage to the next so he came up with an idea to create his own orphanage and he called it youth against human abuse the mission of his orphanage was to reunite the orphans with their families so basically moses sitole once again used the same mo that he was using as a fake businessman that he would go to people and say listen i have an ngo or an orphanage and i'm looking for new employees so he created a fake application and he would distribute this fake application to women only moses sitole got in touch with a prominent photographer and he told the photographer about his organization and what he needed he further told the photographer that he was looking for young women who are looking for a job to run the ngo and secondly he needed the photographer to help him find a home for two homeless children so the photographer knew of a home called kids haven where he was going to show him and then he would take these two homeless kids to kids haven these two homeless kids never existed he just wanted to gain access to a homeless shelter in johannesburg so he can meet up with a woman that is looking for a job with a better pay in the same field as social services so when the photographer and moses sitole got to kids haven he met a woman by the name of trifina mkhozi trifina mkhozi was a young woman that worked at kids haven he approached her and said to her hey guess what i have a job for you i just opened my own orphanage and i'm looking for new employees and i'm going to pay them a monthly salary of whatever amount it was but from what i understand the amount the amount that he told her was a lot of money more money than she was earning from kids haven and trifina was like yep i'm going to jump at this opportunity and take it her colleagues even remember feeling really jealous and envious of trifina for having found a job that was going to pay better now with trifina he was taking care of her child as well as her mother and two brothers from the salary that she was earning from kids haven so Trifina did not waste any time. She applied for the job and about a day later, Moses came back to Trifina with a big smile on his face and said, Hey, guess what? You've been accepted to work at, at Youth Against Human Abuse. Of course, Trifina was over the moon. She could not believe her luck. Again, Trifina's colleagues were very happy for her. Unfortunately, that would be the last time they ever heard from Trifina again. Trifina's disappearance was the right break that the police needed because her disappearance led them straight to Moses Sitole. By August of 1995, Moses Sitole had already killed 20 women. He had dumped their bodies in isolated areas around Johannesburg. So on the 15th of September 1995, Moses woke up from his Atresville home and took the train and went to Benoni where he was going to meet Trifina. Moses had promised her that he was going to take her to her new job. But instead, he took Trifina to an isolated area where he beat her up, raped her, and then murdered her. When Trifina did not come home, her sister was very worried. The sister said they began to panic. Her mother wasted no time and went straight to the police station to report her missing. 
The following day, the newspapers published a photo of Trifina. That is when Trifina's colleagues at Kids Haven learned that Trifina was missing. And they were very worried because the last person that they saw her with was with Moses Sitole. In October of 1995, a police reservist who was off duty, in fact, he was off on that day, decided to go into the isolated field to hunt for rabbits. And this area was near the Benoni prison. When he came across a litter of bodies of women, Trifina Mukhotsi's body was amongst the 10 bodies that were found near the Boxberg prison. Not Benoni, Boxberg prison. Sorry about that. When the news broke, the communities around Boxberg prison were up in arms. They went to the area where these 10 bodies were found and began to pray. They were praying for the dead, but at the same time, they wanted justice for the 10 women that were found on that field. So that's when the police pieced together information around Trifina and they discovered that she worked at an orphanage called Kids Haven. And so they made their way to Kids Haven to interview the employees there about Trifina's disappearance. Trifina's former colleagues told the police that on the day of Trifina's disappearance, she had gone to meet a man by the name of Moses Sitole. Now, the Sitole surname in South Africa is very common surname. So the police were like, oh my goodness, this is going to be like looking for a needle in a haystack. But while they were busy digging for any Moses Sitole on the system, they came across a mugshot. The following day, they took this mugshot to Trifina's colleagues and showed them that mugshot and said, do you recognize this man? One of Trifina's colleague, Esther, who was also Trifina's best friend, said that's exactly the man that came and offered Trifina a job. And this is the exact man that Trifina was going to meet on the day of her disappearance. Now, the police had a possible face to the murders of all these women for the past year and a half. So at this point in time, Moses Sitole kind of like knew that his time was almost up. So he wants to go out with a bang. So he decided that, mm -mm, let me play a game with the police. He then decided to call the media himself so he can explain why he was doing what he was doing. So he decided to call a very popular newspaper in Johannesburg called The Star. However, Moses Itola wanted to know one thing and one thing only from the media. What do the police know so that he would plan for his next move don't underestimate Moses Sitole remember I said in the remember I said earlier in this video that Moses Sitole is quite smart so on the 2nd of October 1995 Moses Sitole goes to a paid phone and calls the star newspaper and it's the and his phone call was answered by a woman called called Tasmin De Beer when Tasmin De Beer answered the phone call the first word that the caller said was I am the man that everyone is looking for. However, the man on the other side of the line introduced himself as Joseph, not Moses Sitole. And he claimed that he was responsible for the murders of all those women. The journalist could not believe what she was hearing. She even said that all that she could hear in her head was bells ringing. But she had to come to immediately and began to transcribe every word that Moses Sitole was telling her over the line. So for the next three days, Joseph would call De Beer and have long conversations about everything that had transpired. De Beer said that she was building some sense of trust between her and this Joseph person because she wanted to get as much information as she could. However, she even had her doubts that the man on the phone might not be what he says he is. But she continued to listen to him anyway and transcribed everything that he was telling her. So when Tasmin asked Joseph, why were you killing? And this is what Joseph said. I am killing out of revenge for being wrongfully convicted of rape. And he further said, I am drawing attention to the injustice that I have suffered. 
So Monsi Toilet rapes Doris. Doris then calls the police. He gets arrested, serves seven years in prison, and still thinks that he's innocent? I mean, that was an injustice? It was false accusation? That is one type of fucked up I've ever heard. I think he was very angry that in prison he was raped. He tasted his own medicine when he, when he was sentenced in that prison. Moses then tells the beer that he does not want to be caught by the police. He said his motive for calling the Star newspaper was because he wanted to outsmart the police. Joseph did feel that the beer was beginning to doubt him. So he assured her that he is the serial killer that the police are looking for. So he further told the beer information about the killings that only the killer and the police would know. So as Joseph was getting more and more comfortable with the beer over the line, he then started telling her, basically, he started spilling his guts and told the beer of everything that was transpiring why he was killing these women. He would tell her that some of the women would beg him for their lives, but he would still kill them anyway. He further told her that some women would fight him. They would fight him so hard that he would actually struggle with them until he wins and strangles them to death. He said some of the women were as strong as men. That's how strong when a woman is near death, she fights like a man. But he overpowered her and killed her and killed her. He even said some, when they realize what's about to happen to them, they just did not protest. They did not fight. They just gave up and he would just strangle them to death. He says that all these different types of women, he found them fascinating, whether they were resisting, whether they were fighting him back or they were giving up from the moment they realized what's going to happen to them. He found all of that fascinating. So Tasmin Dibira then decided to take the transcripts to the police and show them that she has been communicating with the serial killer. However, the police were uncertain that, that Dibira was talking to the right man. So she went back to her office and then she wants to get a new angle on how she was going to convince herself as well as the police that indeed she was talking to the serial killer. So she came up with a plan if he called again. And indeed, Joseph called Debir once again. And this time, Debir asked the man, Hey, can you give me proof that you are indeed the serial killer? So Joseph then decided to say, Okay, fine. It seems like you are doubting me, but let me prove it to you. There is a location in the East Rand where, where you are going to find a body of a woman. This body is quite old. It's possible that it's now a skeleton. In that area, you are going to find a piece of metal. And under the piece of metal is her body or her skeletons. Joseph tells the bearer that he did go recently to that body just to make sure that the body was still there. He said that he did lift the piece of metal and indeed the body was still there. And he says to the bearer, when you get there, you will see that she's skeletons. And just to make sure that the beer understands that he is indeed the serial killer, he gives her another body that she will find hanging from a tree. And this body is fresh, probably starting to decompose. And that is when the beer ran to the police with the information and the police ran to the first location in the East Rand where they searched everywhere in that field. They found a piece of metal. When they lifted the metal, there were skeletons of a woman. And then the police ran to the second location where they found the body of a 31 year old woman who has been missing for the past two days, hanging from the tree, as Joseph had described her. So that's when the police started to formulate a plan on how they are going to capture Joseph. So they decided that they are going to stake out nearby the Star newspaper headquarters where if Joseph called again, they will be able to trace the call and rush into that area and search for him and capture him. And indeed, Joseph called the Beers once again. But before they could continue with their conversation, because Joseph was curious to know if the Beer did go and look for the bodies, 
that he had told her about so that she can believe that indeed she is speaking to the serial killer. So the bill said, okay, listen, because you are speak because you are calling me from a paid phone, why don't you give me the number of that paid phone so that I can call you back if you run out of money? Joseph thought that was a brilliant idea. So when he ran out of money, then Tasmin called back on that very number that uh, Moses was calling and Moses picked up the call. And then the police did trace the call to have been coming from a nearby train station. So I think I know this train station. I think it's the Johannesburg Park station because it's not far from the Stars headquarters. I know because I used to pass there when I used to go to school. So Joseph and De Beers started talking as usual and De Beers aim was to make sure that he keeps Joseph as long as she can while the police were looking for him in that train station. So while they were talking, Joseph for some reason started feeling strange and that's when the phone went dead. When De Beers kept going, hello, 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 there was no response from Joseph. Joseph had made a run for it the moment he felt something wasn't right so the police were desperate to find joseph because they cannot afford another dead body on their hands so on the 13th of october 1995 moses Atole's photo appears on the newspapers as well as television around johannesburg and pretoria that is when moses Atole went back to the paid phone and called the beers and when he called the beers, he was not happy with her. He was shouting at her, saying, you betrayed me. I trusted you. Why would you do something like that to me? What did I do to you? Um, you killing people? A few days later, Moses Sitole then decided to call his brother-in-law, Maxwell. He wanted to borrow his gun. Maxwell was like, hey, bro, I'm going to help you out. Come to my factory where I work and I will give you the gun. <laughs> After Moses and Maxwell made the arrangement to meet at his factory, that's when Maxwell called the police and told them that he and Moses had planned to meet up at a certain time where he worked at. So the police then devised a plan. That's when the police designated an undercover cop as a security guard at the factory. So in the moment that Joseph comes to the factory, the undercover cop will then place Moses Sitole under arrest. So when Moses Sitole arrived at the factory, once again, he had a sense that he was being set up. He made a run for it the moment he had that feeling. And that is when the undercover cop ran after Moses. That's when Moses turned around, took out an axe and charged at, at the undercover cop. And the undercover cop then took out his gun and then Moses ran into the dark. And that's when the undercover cop started shooting randomly. He hit Moses on the abdomen as well on his leg and he collapsed. They immediately called the ambulance and the ambulance rushed him to the hospital. The investigating officer was by his bedside and interrogating him about everything that had transpired. All that the police wanted to find out from Moses at that particular point in time was the bodies that they have discovered. Were there any more that they did not know about? And that is when Moses turned around on his bed and said, I don't know. The investigating officer asked him once again, are the bodies that we have in our possession the exact amount of bodies you know about? That's when Moses looked dead into the eye of the investigating officer and said, I don't know, I wasn't with you. So when the police realized that Moses was being uncooperative, they then decided to change strategy. They decided to bring in a police woman. Maybe the plan will work, he will talk. And indeed, the plan did work. But Moses Sitole did something extremely disgusting and very strange. When the police woman sat down and started interrogating Moses Sitole, he did admit to all the murders that he had committed. All of them were 37 women at that point in time. And as he was describing them, he was basically aroused, like aroused. And he started masturbating in the presence of the female police woman as he described how he murdered this woman, how they begged for, for their lives, how they fought him. He just continued masturbating. Like, oh.
I keep thinking how terrible it must have been for this police woman. But she was on a job though. Then the police woman asked him, why did you do it? He responded, I did it to teach them a lesson. Huh? What? <sighs> How do you kill a person to teach them a lesson? I I'm flabbergasted, honestly speaking. I I'm... I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. So the day that he was shot by the police, it was the 18th of October, 1995. So after recovering from hospital, Mosey Tolle was then transferred to a Pretoria prison where he was going to await his trial. So while Moses Tolle was being transferred from the hospital to his prison cell, he was threatened by people that were waiting for him outside of the hospital. They were baying for his blood. Moses was heavily guarded by special unit of the police in South Africa. They did not want anything to happen to him. They wanted him to face the full might of the law. So while he was in jail awaiting his trial, one of his prison inmates decided to smuggle a secret camera so that he can tape the conversation about the things that he has done to those women. I personally think that it was either a journalist that got access to become a inmate or it was one of the investigating officers because they wanted more information so that the prosecutors would secure a successful prosecution and conviction or it was just an inmate who was just curious and maybe worshipped Moses Sitole for all the things that he has done so successfully for over a year and a half. So the inmate then built some sort of trust between him and Moses and then he started recording secretly and he asked Moses some types of questions. So the inmate asked Moses, so how long does it take to strangle a human? Moses responds by saying, few minutes, three minutes at most, but five minutes is too long. And on the tape, he further describes his hatred for women. He says on the tape, I fully hate a black woman. A woman can hurt you more than a man, more than anybody in this world. That's what he's heard saying on the tape. On the 21st of October 1996, Moses Sitole was officially charged in the Pretoria High Court for 38 murders and 40 rapes. However, the police believe that it's more than 38 murders that Moses Sitole had committed. In fact, they think it's 76 women, all in all, that Moses Sitole had murdered. 140 witnesses took the stand in the Pretoria High Court during Moses Sitole's trial. One of the witnesses was Esther Matangu, who was Trifina's best friend as well as colleague at Kids Haven. Esther Matlangu describes her experience in court as terrified. She was terrified of Moses Sitole. She said that the man looked so relaxed that when, whenever she was testifying in court, Moses was laughing at her. He would even shake his head in disbelief of what she was saying. And Esther felt that she was terrified that he might come after her. DNA linked Moses Sitole to all the 38 murders that he had committed and the 40 rapes. But the confession on the secret tape was overwhelming evidence to the court. So outside the courtroom, women were marching and protesting and singing songs asking, Why are you killing us, Moses? What have we done to you? When the women outside the court heard that Moses Sitole was being arrogant in court, they asked the judge, please release him to us. We will punish him ourselves. So when South Africa entered democracy in 1994, the interim constitution had abolished the death penalty. So instead of Moses Sitole, if found guilty, sentenced to death, he will not be able to sentence to be sentenced to death because the death penalty was no longer legal in South Africa. South Africans felt that the death penalty was inhumane and unusual form of punishment. 
So the court had heard and seen enough in the trial of Moses Sitole, and then it had decided that Moses Sitole will never have contact with another woman again. So on the 5th of December 1997, Moses Sitole was found guilty of the murder of 38 women and 40 rapes. The Pretoria judge sentenced Moses Sitole to 2,410 years in prison. Of course, Moses Sitole looked shocked. He could not believe what he was hearing. 2,410 years in prison for murdering just women? What? He was shocked. He did not believe it. He thought that he was going to get acquitted despite the overwhelming evidence that was presented in court despite him confessing in that secret tape that he murdered this woman and how he found a pleasure in killing them so much so that even when the police woman that was interviewing him he confessed to murdering this woman while he was masturbating in the presence of the police woman and he thought he was going to be acquitted guys this man is sick however women across south africa felt that moses sitole deserved to die he deserved to die too as much as moses sitole was saying the reason why he was killing these women it's because these women that he was killing they reminded him of doris who falsely accused him of rape and he went and was sentenced to seven years in prison where he endured suffering and he promised himself that Doris was going to suffer over and over and over again. I'm assuming what he was saying was, I am going to kill every woman that looks like you. And every time you find out about it, whether on the news or in the newspaper or from people, you will feel the guilt for all these women that I have murdered. That's what I think he meant. I could be wrong, but that's what I think. Moses Itole was then sent to start to serve his 2,410 years imprisonment at the Pretoria CMEX security facility which is situated inside the Pretoria Central Prison. That's the same prison that Ananias Mate was in and escaped. Like how? Moses Itole will be held there without a possibility of a pardon or parole. In prison, Moses Sitole said that who they were, where they came from, he did not care. All he cared about was the revenge he had on Doris for falsely accusing him of rape. So if you ask me why he was killing those women, I don't think it's because of Doris. I think it's because of his mother or the women that had abused him while he was growing up. Remember, he said, I hate a black woman. A black woman can hurt you more than a man and uh, all that sort of stuff. I think he meant his mother because remember, he did run away from an orphanage to his mother's arm and his mother took him by the hand and dragged him back to the orphanage. And basically, I never found out what really happened to his mother, if they ever reunited when he was older. Nothing. I, I couldn't find anything about that. But I still think that it is his mother. And these women that he was keeping, it was a type of women that he was killing. Not every woman. It was a certain type. And I think that certain type was the one that looked like his mother. And then he was killing them, I think. So Doris is just an excuse, I think. Because he does recognize that he raped her. But he, in his mind, he thinks, no, I did not rape her. So, I don't know, I could be wrong. Please do comment down below and let me know what you guys think was the reason he was killing. Other than that, I am not a person that condones excuses because there are a lot of people that have gone through worse things in life as young people or in their younger days, but turned out to be upstanding members of society who are contributing positively in their societies or communities. So what's different about anyone else that grows up under very harsh circumstances? I don't know. Me, I'm sorry. We can argue this the whole day, but there is no excuse why you kill innocent people. There is no way that innocent people have done something to you. If you're angry at somebody, go and do whatever it is to that person that you're angry at. 
and leave innocent people alone. They've done nothing to you. Even if they do look like your mom or Doris or whoever, they are still innocent. They did nothing to you. All these women were doing was to find a job so they can able to take care of their families and themselves. Well, that is it, guys. The true crime of South Africa's worst serial killer, also known as ABC serial killer, Moses Sitole. Thank you so much for watching my video. And please, guys, do like this video because it helps my channel to grow the algorithm. And also, if you have not subscribed to my channel, please, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell notification so that you do not miss out on any of my new true crime videos. And please also leave me a comment down below. I would like to hear what you guys think of this case. And also, do share this video far and wide. And I will see you next time with a new true crime video. Goodbye.